medical friend, Dr. Rajput. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Well, the stage has been set by Krishna, where he has tried to touch upon that there is an increasing problem of kidney disease as well as its problems in patients of diabetes. Now, what I am going to do over next 20-25 minutes, based on what Krishna has set in, I will first let you know why it is important. There is a new syndrome. All of us during medicine training has been taught about hepatorenal syndrome. But we never talk about cardiorenal syndrome. What are different types of cardiorenal syndromes? And these things are very important for all of us. And then actually why we need credence trial, first of all. Why there is a need for credence trial when there is an empire outcome, when there is a canvas trial, when there is a declare trial, and the message is there, though there are exploratory analysis, what is the need for credence trial and what information we can draw out of credence trial. So this is what I am going to discuss over next few minutes. Worldwide, if you see, whether it is United States of America or India, it is diabetes nowadays which is a leading cause of chronic kidney disease. And that has been actually renamed as DKD, diabetic kidney disease. We are no longer calling kidney disease and diabetes as CKD. It is DKD. And if you see, when I was a student, probably in those days, hypertension used to be the commonest cause. Diabetes has now surpassed all the causes and DKD is a renal. This is one of the largest Indian data regarding prevalence. Two studies has been published, one in IJEM and then the complete one was published in Journal of Diabetes where more than 3,000 patients across the country from different parts of the country and lot of our colleagues have participated in this study to find out what is prevalence of CKD in patients of type 2 diabetes. Roughly 50% of the patient at some point of time in diabetes actually were having diabetic kidney disease. And it is irrespective of duration. Means even at right at the time of diagnosis of diabetes, good number of our patients are either having albumin excretion, which is on the higher range, or having reduction in EGFR. So this is a real problem. This is not a theoretical discussion. And as you have learned in previous lecture, that if you see and if you compare a person who is having CKD, who is having diabetes, or who is having DKD, which is a di diabetic kidney disease, lifespan of that individual is reduced by around 16 years. And we have to change this outcome. And why this is happening? Why this is happening is because if you see any cardiovascular mortality and see and compare it in patients who are having kidney disease vis-a-vis -vis no kidney disease. Patients who are having kidney disease, they are much more predisposed to develop various types of cardiovascular mortality. So probably there is a link between two. So we have to look through a window where two things are linked to each other. Apart from that, there are a lot of talks now virtually in every conference, about two, three con lectures on heart failure, role of SGLT2 in heart failure. But if a patient develops diabetic kidney disease, he is more predisposed to develop cardiac dysfunction. And why this is happening? This is cardiorenal syndrome. I do not know how many of you know, there are five different types of cardiorenal syndromes. And out of that, type 2 and type 4 are important for us. If we see type 2, type 2 is basically chronic cardiorenal syndrome where patient is having chronic heart failure. But this chronic heart failure predisposes the patient to develop chronic kidney disease also. If you see type 4, which is chronic renocardiac syndrome, these patients are having predominantly chronic kidney disease, which we will label as a diabetic kidney disease. But this will predispose an individual to develop premature cardiovascular disease. So this is cardiorenal syndrome of which there are five types. And as a diabetologist or endocrinologist, we see type 2 and type 4 very often in chronic care. There are acute problems which we are not discussing. So we, we should find out therapies. We should address both these things together. Now, diabetes and kidney disease is known to us from years. And if we see renal trial where losartan was tested and IDNT trial where irbisartan is tested. And that forms the basis where ARBs are now used as a therapy to reduce albumin excretion to change outcome of patients with diabetes and kidney disease. But see, this has happened more than 20 years ago. And in last 20 years, after availability of losartan 
and ribisartan. We do not have any new therapy which can change the outcome of our patients in terms of reducing cardiovascular disease or in terms of reducing renal disease. And also just look at this P value which is 0 0.02 in both the, because when we are going to discuss credence trial, the importance of P value will be evident to us. Stronger is a P value, more is the evidence. So it is just 0 0.02, but still that forms the basis. And why ACE inhibitors are effective? Because they act on efferent side of the tubule. The ACE receptors are present on efferent side. There is no ACE receptor present on efferent side. And by blocking those receptors, we are dilating efferent arterioles. And by dilating efferent arteriole, there is going to be dip in intraglomerular pressure. The result is reduction in albumin excretion. On the other side, because of this property only, when you start a patient on ACE or ARB, during first few weeks, there is an initial slight rise in serum creatinine, which tends to stabilize. Some of our colleagues are worried, but up to 30% rise in serum creatinine in a patient to whom you are putting up on ACE and ARB is an expected rise. So this is how ACE and ARBs are acting. And as I have told you, if you see the history, there are a number of drugs which has been tried across the country by researchers, but they have failed actually to show any superiority outcome in patients of type 2 diabetes and kidney disease. So last 20 years, we do not have any drug. We know about SGLT2 inhibitor. All these things are known to us. So we have to look beyond it. Apart from reducing glucose, body weight, benefits on blood pressure, slow on, blah, 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 they have some important effects on end organ damage. And why it is happening? Because SGLT2 act on afferent side of the tubule. ACE and ABS act on efferent side of the tubule. While SGLT2 acts on afferent side of the tubule, they causes vasoconstriction of afferent, again resulting in a drop in EGFR, and, and initial EGFR is decreased, but since intraglomerular pressure is reducing, your albumin excretion will reduce, and probably it will result in a beneficial outcome in long terms. So here comes credence trial. This is actually just I'm trying to make the basis that can agliflozin and renal endpoints in patients of diabetes and establish kidney disease. Now this is a global multicentric trial involving 34 countries, 690 cities, and more than 4,400 participants. Why the need? What is the importance? Krishna has actually shown you this data about Canvas, Empareg, and Declare where it is an exploratory endpoint. It is not a primary endpoint. And our guidelines changes, recommendations comes only based on change in primary endpoints. In none of these three trials, the renal outcomes are primary endpoints. They are exploratory endpoints. And as you have seen in this forest plot graph, the big diamond shows that there is benefit in renal endpoints in all the three trials. So this is an exploratory. This is a hypothesis generating. This will stimulate researchers to take up a dedicated renal study to find out whether really our patients who are having diabetic kidney disease, when they were given an SGLT2 inhibitor, uh, whether they are going to be benefited or not. And then what is happening to their cardiac endpoints? Because we know patients of kidney disease are predisposed to develop premature cardiovascular mortality. So we have to look from the other angle. Apart from that, this is a demographic characteristic of credence study where you see hypertension, prevalence of hypertension is around 97%, 15% of the patients were having heart failure, even 24% of the patients were having peripheral vascular disease, and 5% of the patients were having amputation. This is distribution according to the EGFR and albumin excretion. Now some of you are interested that what's the difference between three previous CVOT outcome and credence trial. If you see CANVAS trial, only 20% of the patients involved were having EGFR of less than 60. In Empareg outcome, only 26%. And in Declare, actually majority were having more than 60 ml. It is only 9% which were having EGFR of less than 60. So we actually cannot extrapolate this data to CKD, which is defined as an EGFR persisting to less than 60 ml more than three months. In contrast, more than 60% of the patient in credence trial who were studied were having an EGFR of less than 60 ml. If we see urinary albumin ratio more than 300, only 7 to 8% of the patient in these three outcome trials were actually having macroalbuminuria. In contrast, 
88% of the patients who were studied in credence trial were having urinary albumin excretion more than 300. And if you see the mean, mean eGFR is 85. This is virtually a normal GFR as he ages. After 40 years of age, with every decade of life, actually there is a decline in eGFR even in health. So if you are seeing an individual at 70 years of age, an 85 eGFR is virtually normal for that individual. So we cannot extrapolate this data to that gentleman. And if you see canvas, eGFR mean is 76. If you see Amparag, it is 74. And see the albumin excretion, it is in a normal range, mean, 13, 12, and 18. Even microalbuminuria is not present in these trials. In contrast, in credence trial, the mean GFR is 56. And mean albumin excretion is 927. So it's a significant macroalbuminuria. And what are the primary outcome results? The composite primary outcome, which consists of progression to ESRD, doubling of serum creatinine, renal death, or CV death. The composite is reduced by 30%. And I have told you to remember the p-values shown in renal and IDNT. What it was? 0 0.02. And see the p-value here. 0.0001. Which means the, there is a less than one in one million chance that this will be a chance finding. It is, the drug is really making some difference in pathophysiology of diabetic kidney disease. So the primary composite output is reduced significantly. If we see the individual component of primary endpoints, progression to ESRD, doubling of serum creatinine, all show significant differences. Now an important issue is eGFR, because sometimes this thing is argued. When we start an SGLT2, initially there is going to be a decline in eGFR. But later on it stabilizes and patient will have a better kidney outcome. If we see credence patient, and these are baseline eGFR in placebo and in canagliflozin R. And as these patients are given this drug, the mean decline in eGFR in a placebo arm is 4.5 per year. In contrast, it is only 1.8 in patients who were given canagliflozin. So it means over long term, reduction of eGFR is more in placebo group, significantly more as compared to placebo. How does it translate into clinical practice? What we are going to do to our patients? Now if you see again and extrapolate this data, an average credence patient age is 63 years, an elderly patient with an eGFR of 56. Now, if you start canagliflozin in this patient, and if you follow up this patient on a placebo, where a decline of eGFR is around 4.59 ml per year, you will see that this patient will reach a GFR of less than 10 ml in next 10 years. So in next 10 years, this individual will be requiring dialysis. In contrast, if you start canagliflozin, and if the GFR decline will happen at a rate of 1.85 ml per minute, then this individual will reach to a GFR of less than 10 ml in the next 25 years. So what we are buying, we are finding a difference of 15 years. So we are avoiding the use of dialysis by starting a drug for next 15 years. So this is a significant incremental advantage of starting patients on SGLT2 canagliflozin when they are having an eGFR of less than 60 with macroalbuminuria where simply adding a single drug will give you an additional 15 years free of dialysis. And mind you, this is happening over and above use of ACE and ARBs. 99% of the patients recruited in this trial were receiving ACE and ARBs. So over and above, you are now getting 15 years free of dialysis. So this is a wonderful outcome. Last 20 years, we have not seen this thing happening with any other drug. If we see three-point mace, because patients who are having DKD, they are also predisposed for premature cardiovascular disease. If we see three-point mace, again, it is reduced by 20% with a significant p-value. So a trial which is primarily designed to look at benefits on cardiovascular disease, on renal disease, also find benefits in reduction in three-point 
maze. So this is an entire summary of credence which involved both renal outcome, which involved T-point maze, which involved reduction in hospitalization for heart failure, and which involved reduction in CV death. Now what is an NNT? If the p-value is so impressive, what is the number needed to treat to change a CV or renal outcome over next 2.5 years, which is an average duration in credence trial? If you see primary renal composite output, you need to treat only 22 patients. If you see DSRD, doubling of serum creatinine, renal death, the NNT is 28. For ESRD alone, it is 43. For hospitalization for heart failure, 46. And CV death, 40. Now, you have listened in previous lecture, Krishna saying that the benefit is more in those who are having an eGFR towards normal side. Now, the other side which has been seen in this trial is that the NNT, and if you see the benefit and hazard ratio in this forest plot graph, the maximum benefit is actually seen in individual who are having eGFR between 45 to 60. Now, this is a high risk individual where we want to be an aggressive treatment to prevent its progression to a lower GFR. So the maximum benefit is seen in this group. And if you now calculate the NNT in this group between 30 to 45 ml, because otherwise these patients are going to fast progress to dialysis. The number needed to treat is only 16. So these are some of the wonderful results which have come up with this drug. Now what about primary versus secondary prevention? This is a common question. But actually, I, uh, to be honest, if we remember our community medicine preaching, when we see a diabetic patient, the concept of primary prevention itself is out. Because we do not date the onset of type 2 diabetes. Good number of patients of type 2 diabetes are already having one or the other microvascular complication at baseline. So what we are talking of actually. Actually, all patients of type 2 diabetes comes under secondary prevention. But then still, as a theoretically, what those who are having kidney disease versus not having kidney disease. In this subgroup analysis, they have shown that the benefit is observed both in terms of primary prevention as well as in terms of secondary prevention. Now coming to renal safety, because there are some issues about renal safety, about fracture, about amputation, which have come up after publication of CANVAS program. If we see the hyperkalemia and acute kidney injury, it is not significantly different as compared to placebo and credence arm. What about fractures? Again, as you compared the total number between placebo and drug, it is 67 and 68, hardly any difference. So again, failed to show any harmful effect on bone. As well as fracture, or oh sorry, ex amputation, lower extremity amputation is concerned. In fact, total number are more in placebo arm as compared to canagliflozin arm. So again, the, the risk which has been seen in that canvas program is not seen in credence. But we have to be cautious what we have learned from past that those who are having peripheral vascular disease or those who are having prior amputation, those who are having diabetic foot ulcer which are non-healing, probably we tend to avoid canagliflozin in that group. But we are very reassured by seeing that there is no increased risk of amputation in credence trial. If we see the amputation worry in real world data, in canvas and in credence, as you see clearly, there is no signal overall worldwide, even in real world use of canagliflozin regarding amputation. Though this question is asked by our colleagues again and again and again in various conferences because of so many reasons. Now coming to guidelines, I will not discuss them in detail. Already they have been discussed by a number of our colleagues. But if patient is having CKD, then probably over and above even GLP-1 receptor SGLT2 are drug of choice. And if you are treating CKD among three SGLT2 inhibitor, it is probably now canagliflozin with scores over DAPA and AMPA because of credence trial where it is a primary endpoint. With none of the two drugs, it has been studied as a primary endpoint. So some, sometime again this question is asked, how to choose an SGLT2 in different diseases? So for reduction of DKD and its issues, Probably we have now evidence with canagliflozin. Now coming to recent updates. In our country, none of the gliflozin is approved for use at GFR less than 45 ml. This is status as of now in our country. Even worldwide in Europe, some of the SGLT2 are to be used when eGFR is more than 60. Now in United States of America, 
based on credence data, they have changed their recommendation and SGLT2 can be used even up to eGFR of 30 ml at a dose of 100 milligram per day. Up to 300 milligram we can go, but if your GFR is between 45 ml to 30, the dose of canagliflozin is 100 milligram, which is the dose used in credence trial. But see the star which has been shown here. If your patient is having both eGFR between 45 to 30 and albumin excretion more than 300 milligram, even in this subgroup of patient, based on evidence, you can up titrate the dose to 300 milligram. So, but you have to be cautious because this dose is not tested. Apart from that, if we see the individual label updates of US FDA for canagliflozin, empagliflozin, and dapagliflozin, it is an, as an adjunct diet and exercise. For reduction of three point mace, it is only for canagliflozin. For change in kidney outcome, it is for canagliflozin. For reduction of CV death, it is for empagliflozin. For prevention of hospitalization for heart failure, it is for dapagliflozin. For hemogliflozin, there is no label update, simply for control of glucose lowering. So this is the current recommendation for you when you are prescribing different type of SGLT2 inhibitor. And in future, we have number of other studies which is planned and trying to study same aspect which has been done with canagliflozin and credence. So it's a game changer as I have told you. It has shown us wonderful changes in renal outcome. So friends, to conclude with, SGLT2 is probably a must for many. Apart from glucose, weight and blood pressure, which is common to the class. With canagliflozin, we have reduction in progression to dialysis, progression to ESRD, reduction in progression of decline in eGFR, benefit in terms of three-point maze and death. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Any questions? They are most welcome.